welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Now, you've heard us say this before, we have 5th gen aircraft flying with 3rd gen weapons, and while this isn't a perfect analogy, there is some truth to it. The reality is that our air-to-air weapons inventory boils down to just three choices, a medium-range missile, the AIM-120 Advanced Medium-Range Air-to-Air Missile, or AMRAM for short, the AIM-9 Sidewinder, an infrared heat-seeking missile, and the gun. Chambered in 20mm for most fighters and a 25mm round for the F-35. While these weapons have had many upgrades and improvements over the years, they're still built in the same general outer mold line that has physical limitations. Think about it. You can only shrink the hardware so much to make room for more propellant, or upgrade the software for better flight performance, or improve the seeker's technology to increase detection of an enemy aircraft. At the end of the day, you are still stuck with the physical size and shape of these two missiles. And while I have fired the gun in combat, And of course, it's every fighter pilot's dream to hose down another aircraft after a swirling dervish. The reality is, the gun is an insurance policy rather than a primary game plan. So just like Maverick being too close for missiles, switching to guns is a backup plan. Now, believe it or not, the AIM-120 went IOC over 30 years ago. And the AIM-9, well, versions of it have been in service since the mid-1950s. In fairness, it has evolved a lot, but you get my point. And that takes us to today's discussion. We need to evaluate the capabilities and capacity of our air-to-air weapons to bring us up to the same technological breakthroughs that we did with the F-22 and F-35 airframes. The case for weapons advancement becomes even more pressing as we look at sixth generation designs and where adversaries like China are going. Joining us today is Lieutenant General Joseph Gus Guastella, who currently serves as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations on the Air Staff at the Pentagon. Gus has commanded at nearly every level in the United States Air Force, including Squadron Commander of the famed Triple Nickel at Aviano Air Base, Italy. He's also served as the Wing Commander at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. He's a graduate of the Fighter Weapons School. He also instructed there as well. And you have to note that Gus has flown in combat throughout the majority of his career in both the F-16 and the A-10. Well, General Guastella, welcome to the Aerospace Advantage. It is so awesome to have you here. It's like, thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here and uh, and on the show today. Well, sir, I know, I mean, you and I have a 20-year history, actually, this year. 20 years ago, I showed up to the Triple Nickel uh, when you were the DO. And I know from your history and, and all of our conversations that you've flown, you know, almost every variant of, of the Viper and, you know, the, the missiles that uh, are in our air-to-air inventory. So, you know the F-16 so well, obviously, as a guy who uh, flew it in combat and was a student and an instructor at the weapons school. And... Uh, you know, you've, you've seen the progression of this Papas and Guns, Day VFR only fighter grow into something that's obviously almost, other than the look of the airplane, it's a totally different jet than w- what it was uh, originally uh, designed to be. So can you just talk us to, you know, some of the platform improvements that you've seen and, and you've integrated? No, thanks, Slick. I, and I agree. Yeah, the, uh, you know, looking back in history, the S-16 was designed to be uh, part of the high-low mix, the uh, high-low fighter mix, F-15C and F-16, where the F-16 was going to be the high-volume, relatively lower-cost day VFR fighter capable of servicing a lot of targets in the European theater, uh, and it did exceptionally well. And then most of the air-to-air game at that time was uh, was the F-15Cs, uh, and the F-16s were primarily in a defensive air-to-air role, with what was how we were armed. Uh, it was it was also uh, we were also back in the in the Cold War primarily a low altitude ingress. That was what we thought was the only survivable way was to come in low, uh, hit our targets, be a pop attack, and and then get out. But about the same time that Desert Shield and then Desert Storm kicked off, the realization became that hey, we really need to be operating at medium altitude to survive out there against the threats. Um, and and about that same time, we also realized that the F-16 is incredibly capable if we put sufficient air-to-air munitions on there to make it an air-to-air fighter along with its as a multi-role fighter but with good air-to-air capabilities and so over the years we've seen that aircraft go from just a day low altitude bfr fighter doing pop-up attacks delivering dumb bombs on a 10 20 high delivery to delivering almost every uh, form of a precision guided munition rockets 
to the full complement of air-to-air missiles, uh, and it's a very credible fighter now in, in all of the domains, thanks to, thanks to the improvements that have been made to it. Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate that, that background. And, you know, going early on to your lieutenant days, you know, you saw the F-16 get the AIM-120 probably when you first started flying the jet. So, you know, obviously the AMRAM changed the game, right? So uh, how did it change from a tactical perspective? I, I think you probably lived a little bit of that uh, in, in, when you first came on flying the jet, right? Yeah, I tell you, you know, obviously looking back in history a little bit, it was exciting times in the late 80s for, uh, for anyone flying because the wall was still up. And uh, it, it was uh, really a lot of good stick and rudder flying back then uh, was was really how you'd win or, or lose is based on your own skill sets. But one ad- distinct advantage when we would train with our F-15C uh, brethren was that they had a long range air to air missile. They had the AIM-7 Fs and, and mics at the time. And, and as F-16 guys, all we had was AIM-9, so heaters. And guns, and so we were we were relegated to do what we used to jokingly call exploding cantaloupe tactics, which was the only way we could get in on the on the Eagles on a training sortie, was to stay together as a four ship, and then at a certain range we would explode and send one guy really high, send one guy really low, send one guy to the west, send one guy to the east, and maybe out of that explosion we could get one aircraft in untargeted and have a chance against the uh, the Eagles that outgunned us with a better missile. Uh, well, that all changed when the AIM-120 came out because, uh, interestingly, while it was designed to be accommodated on both aircraft, we actually got it first. The F-16s got it a little bit sooner than the F-15Cs did. So the one day we went out there and we were carrying AIM-120s and, the, and suddenly the poor F-15s were having to flop around and do exploding cantaloupes just like we had done. So the tables had turned. Obviously, uh, everyone has it now, and uh, and the missile is a game changer because it's our first ever real active seeking missile, which not only extended the range significantly, but its capability against a wide variety of threats. Yeah, awesome. And and you know through that evolution and your time uh, as an instructor at the weapons school, as I remember, you were heavily involved in F thirty five requirements on your first staff tour. Uh, and obviously, you know we had the AIM nine, and you spoke to the AIM one twenty coming on the scene. And you know essentially, we ended up building this fifth generation fighter to accommodate the the missiles that we had, and essentially built the airframe around the weapon suite that it could carry. Um, do you think we missed an opportunity at that time to innovate? Uh, the weapons to match, you know, the increased capability of this new airframe. I, I think I think we we absolutely did miss an opportunity there, slick. Because you know, the, well, for starters, the F thirty five is a phenomenal platform. It's designed uh, to be a survivable, uh, very capable aircraft, very lethal aircraft uh, in a, in an air to air and an air to ground environment. Uh, but it was constrained by it being a joint development. It had to make three services happy. And, um, and one of the things right off the bat that we saw that would be an issue was its internal carriage, how many missiles it could carry internally. Uh, and we would like to have seen more from that. Or concurrently with, with the F-35, you know, back when we were first thinking about it, would have put equal investment into um, a smaller a more a smaller yet still capable missile that would also have increased the carriage within the the volume of the F-35. So that's that's certainly something that uh, you know in hindsight being 2020 uh, we should have considered. That being said, uh, it's important as we go forward now to get the most we can out of the payload capacity that exists within the F-35. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously, you got to fight and design with what you have, and and uh, and go from there. But uh, you know, one of the things that we've said at Mitchell on the Airspace Advantage, and you know, and, and I say it a little bit tongue in cheek, but you know, we have fifth gen aircraft flying with third gen missiles or weapons. And and I know that's not exactly fair, but uh, there are some inherent limitations at present. So uh, what are key capabilities you'd like to see as we try to better match weapon innovations to match new aircraft capabilities? And of course, I'm thinking about, you know, like NGAD and beyond. Well, you you know, you're, you're, I understand how you, the the label that you put on it. And and in some respects, it's, there's some degree of truth there is that, uh, you know, have the weapons uh, evolved as quickly as some of the fighters have been built. Are they are they on par with the very fighters that are carrying them? If you look at the F-35 and F-22. And I will say in the defense of the uh, AIM-9 and AIM-120 and our partnership with industry, they are not our grandfather's missiles. What's out there today on those rails is has much better range. 
It has much better lethality against uh, in a, in a uh, dense electromagnetic environment, uh, greater maneuverability, essentially greater probability of kill on both the, the heat seeking and the radar side of the house. Um, but that being said, we absolutely need newer variations, new versions of, of, of capabilities in the missile world. We have to, I mean, it, it, is, uh, it is not our God-given right as Americans to have air superiority or air supremacy. But oftentimes, that's what's been expected in these campaigns, because that's what Americans have seen. We go out and slay it in the air, we own the air, and then we can rain down ordinance on the adversaries, as we have in the Middle East for two decades now, with uh, unchallenged in the air. But that won't be the case against superior competitors. So development uh, of very capable munitions to accompany both our fifth and then sixth gen fighters, as well as uh, other platforms uh, that can carry munitions is key. So we have to have a munitions development that's uh, as aggressive and iterative and ex that, that welcomes experimentation in that area to, to keep the chance for air superiority or the, the imperative of air superiority alive. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And and uh, thanks for mentioning that. You know, it is not a God given right, and it's uh, it's uh, airmen working really hard to make sure that we do establish and, and maintain that air superiority. And you know, sir, one of the things uh, that we know about you is not only do you have the operational uh, background, but you also have the the requirement side and then the money side. You know how the whole machine works and how the sausage is made, so to speak. But uh, how do you break it down when it comes to near term evolutionary improvements? Uh, we may be able to net you know, in the next few years on the short term versus, you know, the long term game changing capabilities that you'd like to see in the force down the line? Well, for starters, I think we need a little bit of a balance of both. We have to continue to invest to get the most out of the existing munitions that we have to find that knee in the curve with our aim nines and our aim 120s is where can we still get best value given the fact that we have them they're out there on the line they, they're, they're they're very capable as they are uh what what in, what investments can be put into them to keep them uh c continue uh, an advantage where we have it using the existing munitions but we have to balance that with development of the new munitions and, uh, and getting those dials right, I think, is, is critical for our department. I'll tell you this. You know, we are emerging from 20 years of warfare that did not involve air-to-air -air combat. Very, very rare did we have an air-to-air -air engagement. So it is absolutely an area that requires additional investment. It's not an in-house portfolio. Hey, I'll dial, that, dial this down and dial this up. This is an area much like the entire Air Force, which requires additional investment because now we're being, we're faced with a peer competitor. And a peer competitor is gonna come at us in the air aggressively to try to deny that air superiority that we've had for the last 20 years over the fights that we know. And so that's why I think it's imperative that we maintain uh, and get the most out of our existing legacy munitions, if you have, to continue to keep as much of an edge there, increase their lethality but also those leap ahead munitions. I, I can certainly name some of them, the, uh, you know, the advanced air to air weapons like the JATAM, uh, a, a stand in attack weapon, the SAW, uh, the air launched rapid response weapon, the arrow, and then uh, hypersonic attack cruise missile, the HACM. All of those represent uh, investment, what I would say are imperatives to experiment and to develop, to keep the stick, if you will, the, the, the first look first launch opportunity against our adversaries. Well, awesome, sir. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, you, you being specific there. So thank you for that. And one of the things that come along with your job is I know that you always uh, are engaging with folks in the Pentagon and, of course, going across the river and speaking with our friends on the Hill. So how do you explain to them the cost of not embracing missile modernization that the Air Force needs? Well, you know, it, it's really simple. The cost of not investing in the, in the air to air fight is losing. That's the cost. So if you're willing to accept loss, if you're willing to accept not being able to prosecute our campaign and tremendous embarrassment of, of having, you know, American uh, air crews strewn across uh, the ocean in the water, having been shot down, that's what losing looks like and not being able to realize and protect ourselves. So again, you know, when we own the air, Americans are safe. They're safe at their bases. They're safe uh, on the battle space. They're safe at sea. But when we don't own the air, all of that now comes at risk. So it's an imperative that we maintain our ability to execute the air superiority mission. 
And it doesn't matter if it's a localized, uh, smaller crisis campaign or a major theater war. It's an imperative. And the urgency that I would communicate to the Hill is that is these are not things that we have done much of in the last 20 years because of the nature of the campaigns. You know, ISIS doesn't have an Air Force. The Taliban doesn't have an Air Force. And, and Al-Qaeda doesn't have an Air Force. So we're, we're fighting adversaries that never were able to come at us and, and cause us issue in the air domain. That's not the case against the peer competitor like China. They're going to come at us in that domain first and foremost. And if we can prevail in that domain the way Americans are used to, the rest of our campaign is going to go a whole lot better to either defend our, ourselves or defend our allies and partners or whatever our national objectives are. Absolutely. And, you know, for those that don't get it, all they need to do is turn on the news today and see what's going on in Ukraine. And those uh, those guys fighting the good fight over there. Um you know, obviously would be doing a lot better if they had airplanes and air superiority against uh, their adversary right now. So, uh, sir, I cannot say thanks enough for you being here. Uh, it's been uh, wonderful working with you for the last uh, 20 years and uh, really looking forward to seeing uh, what's next for you. And I just have to sign off by saying once green. Always green. And, and Slick, thank you for what you're doing. And thank you to the Mitchell Institute for the advocacy for our national treasure called air power. Next, I'd like to introduce retired Major General John Norman. John is the Vice President of Customer Requirements and Capabilities at Raytheon Missiles and Defense. As with any conversation we have on the Aerospace Advantage, we try and show all sides of the issue. So while General Gosella helps speak to the operational demand, we also want to hear from those who are involved with innovating next generation solutions from a technological perspective. And it's no secret that Raytheon is one of the global leaders in this area. And one of the things that makes John Norman unique in this conversation is that he's also a career fighter pilot and has served in several Air Force key leadership positions prior to his retirement and joining the industry. So John John, welcome to the Aerospace Advantage. We really appreciate you helping us understand the technological state of play right now. Thanks, Slick. It's uh, great to be here, and you know, really appreciate the forum that, that you all put together. You know, this is we've dedicated our entire adult life to it, and and this is you know something that I think we're all passionate about, and it's just absolutely vital for our nation. So, thank you for taking this on. Well, sir, we've obviously enjoyed tremendous success with both the AIM-9 and AIM-120, and they are iconic. But could you explain to us why it's important for us to take the next step in field improvement systems? We heard from General Gostella, but I'd also like to get your thoughts uh, on this point. And and given your time as a fighter pilot and key leadership positions like the vice of PACAF, you've got some pretty unique insights. Well, it's it's a great question. I I mean, first and foremost, the the reason we exist is is to uh, deter adversaries so that we never have to go to war. And the best way to do that is to have the most capable weapons and platforms and the best trained uh, airmen that we can to, to deter those adversaries. You know, Gus highlighted the point, the evolution of, of the uh, AMRAAM A9. And with respect to the F-16, we both flew F-16s together. Both were, were uh, weapons officers. You know, we, we uh, spent a lot of time developing techniques and, and tactics to try and counter what adversaries are capable of and, and to defeat some of the advantages that they have through the way we employ our weapon system. And that gets you so far. And then you get to the point where you're simply outgunned. And that that's where we need that capability injection. It's, it's interesting. We've seen over the, the past probably six years, I'd say the pendulum swung to a significant focus on experimentation and, and developing prototypes. You know, that's been at the cost of programs of record. And it's been at the cost of delivering fielding capabilities to the warfighter. And I think that the services are getting to that point where they're looking at inventory objectives, especially with the war kicking off in Ukraine. Uh, we, need to, we need to have adequate inventories. And we also need to have the capabilities against these threats. We spend a lot of time uh, working with the service, working with NASIC, uh, to understand what the Chinese and the Russians are doing, how they're evolving their capabilities, both on, on the offensive and defensive weapons. And by doing that, we, we see where those gaps are, and we're able to go into some of our existing programs, like, for instance, AMRAAM. We recently changed out the entire electronic stack in that weapon uh, for modernization. You, you have some components in there that, that they just expire. The manufacturers don't make them anymore. And so it was time to do that. We call it a tech refresh. 
And with that, you completely change out all the computers and, and the way that missile functions. And with that, it brings a lot of capability enhancements and it gives us a lot of growth opportunities. So in the past where the Russians and the Chinese were able to, to decrease the effectiveness of that weapon with different types of jamming, we can counter that today and we can keep our probability kill very high. We've changed the way that the missile flies and, and its propulsion stack so that we get significantly more range out of it, where it, it's pretty easy to be pejorative and say, you know, it's a third gen weapon on a fifth gen platform. Um, I, I'd, I'd point back to the Corvette. So a 1958 Corvette is fundamentally different from a 2022 Corvette. They're still called Corvettes, but it's a completely different vehicle. And I'd say the same is true for, for our AMRAM today. Uh, you, you could use that same comparative analysis to every other weapon system. You know, that uh, Gus spoke at length about the F-16. You know, that has modernized over time to make it an incredibly capable aircraft that performs far beyond its, its design expectation. And so there, there is a lot of capability that you can, you can rapidly deliver to the warfighter by doing what we call PQ die updates to these weapons. And so that's exactly what we've done with, with the AMRAM. Um, I think you've seen the same path with the AIM-9, the infrared missile. So that started out as a uh, AIM-9 Papa, where you had to be right behind the aircraft when you're shooting, to a Lima, which had better capability, to a Mike, even better capability, to now we have the AIM-9X. And, you know, if anybody that's flown with that, you don't want to fly a mission without that on the aircraft. Um, likewise, with the AMRAM, uh, we're exploring different ways to increase range even further. So we're partnered with, with NAMO doing a um, NASAM, so it's, it's a air defense capability, um, a shore ed capability. So they put a, a ESSM rocket motor on the back end of an AMRAM, and that gives you hawk-like range. Uh, you put that in the air, now all of a sudden you're, you're beyond what the Russians and Chinese could do. And so we're working that and we've, we've designed that with a transition section so it fits internal in an F-22 and it fits inside the F-35, the A and the C. So that, that gives significant capability and it gives it in a very, very near term horizon. Is it a replacement for some of the future weapons that the Air Force is, is uh, developing? No, but it, it fills the gap. You know, we, we can accept risk for so long. We've been accepting risk for a very long time and the adversary hasn't been taking a knee during that period of time. While we obviously need to keep this unclassified, are there any specific adversary threats that are helping inform your thinking? Yeah, I, I think the Chinese are probably um, probably the pacing threat. You've heard it in the National Defense Strategy. You certainly heard all the senior leaders in the Air Force and across DOD talk about them. They are a challenging adversary. They, they have um, a very, very strong economy. They're able to invest very heavily in the military complex. They don't play by the same rules that we do, and they're able to go really fast. Uh, they don't have a lot of the same safety precautions that we have as we develop new weapon systems. And they're able to, to develop and field in mass. We talk a lot about the capabilities. Capabilities are good, but you also need capacity. If an adversary, the Chinese, can put up more aircraft than we have missiles in an inventory, that's a problem. And so that has to be part of that calculus that we have in the DOD and certainly within industry. How do we fill that rate so that we can build out the capacity and we can also deliver that new capability? So everything that we do in the military from a capability enhancement standpoint, we've, we've got to look at the threat. We've got to show the gap that the threat has created. That's the need that establishes a requirement. And we have to be able to sell that, not just to the American public, but over on the Hill to Congress and to the Senate. They have to understand, and we have to be very clear in, in the gap that the threat has created. With China as a pacing threat, it's pretty easy to do as they expand globally with their One Belt, One Road initiative. We're seeing them deploy further and further away from mainland China. They're creating threats that create a uh, greater and greater uh, anti-access capability, the A2AD. And that's driving a, a big gap for us in the, in the U.S. military to deter them. And so we've got to have weapons that go at a further range. We have to have weapons that can survive the hostile electromagnetic environment that they're going to develop. And we have to achieve a, a probability of kill that's at a high level because uh, we have a finite number of aircraft that we can fire these weapons from. 
All right, so given everything you're saying and from what General Gosell explained, it sounds like we need some improved options in the near term. Uh, and given that time matters, uh, are we looking at a near term evolutionary path to help get us there? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we, uh, we delivered the first D3 missile last week. Uh, that's the one with this improved electronic stack in it. It's, it's exceeding expectations in testing, which is great. And I, I'd mentioned we're working with NAMO on a um, improved rocket motor that's designed to work in the air so that we can enhance that range, deliver a range that's even further. Uh, the challenge is that's going to come up as, as we field these further range weapons. Um, General Casella, he talked about standing attack weapon. He talked about JATAM. Both us and Lockheed are, are working with DARPA and now with the Air Force on a hypersonic cruise missile, which gives you significant range to hit targets that are beyond fixed. So moving targets, whether it's on the surface or in the air, uh, you have to have a kill chain that'll support that. And this is where, as a warfighter, you look at the complete picture. So the efforts that the Air Force and the, and the Navy and the Army are undertaking with JADC2 are absolutely vital. We've got to be able to sense across the environment at that range that we want to employ this ordinance. We have to be able to find fixed target track the the threats that we want to go after, and we have to meet for the U.S. our rules of engagement, which means we have to maintain a, a level of target ID and track custody and give a clear avenue of fire to be able to engage those type of targets at that depth. It requires a mix of, of these capabilities. So certainly some of this long range future weapon, they'll give us the extreme standoff. And once you've taken down that A2AD protection that that adversary has, now you have to be able to deliver that capacity. And so that's that high volume of weapons that still have that precision that we demand as a, as a U.S. warfighter and, and has a lethality against the target sets that we want to hold at risk, those military targets. Okay, so I've got to ask, what does this mean from a cost perspective? It doesn't take much insight to look at the budget that the Air Force just released to realize that things are tight financially. Yeah, I'd say especially now, I mean, mom and dad are broke. And... You know, we, we need to be as efficient as we can, both on the industry and on the government side. And, you know, if you have the room for modernization within the existing weapon system, that's the fastest way to deliver capability and it's most cost effective because you're, you're not paying all the new integration costs, the fielding. It's that whole tail that goes with any new weapon to include training from the air crew all the way down through the munitions handlers and setting up the supply chain to sustain that over time. So if we can do that with an existing weapon, and we've been doing a lot of really innovative stuff. Down at the um, Air Force Weapons Center, they I think it was a week ago, they dropped a, uh, a JDAM and sunk a ship with that. So a slight modification to an existing weapon, and now you can hold a target set at risk that we weren't able to hold at risk with that weapon before. And that's a way that, that we're able to modify these weapons. With AMRAM, um, I talked that before about about changing the propulsion stack in this. And that's another way that we can deliver a capability that fits inside of our fifth gen aircraft today and gives a greater standoff that we don't have with any other weapon today. And it gives some breathing space until we can afford to fill the new weapon and we have the time for that development because the development is pretty complex. I, I think that there's a lot of room for that. You know, it, it's, it's a difficult decision for the service because they have to balance that investment in the new capabilities as future capabilities with the real and present danger and the capability gaps that we have today. And I think partnering with industry and starting with what's the cost objective, because we have great engineers that'll across all of industry that'll put a lot of time and effort into engineering a silver bullet solution. If we start with the requirement first and we say, here's what the cost objective is, the price point that we're looking for, uh, that's a great constraint. And then as we look at any weapon, whether it's doing a modernization of it or a new weapon, we look at those those elements of the biggest cost driver. And that's an, that's an area where the service can go in. They can contract getting a, a economic order of quantity for something large, like call it a weapons data link. And that tends to be a big cost driver, secure processors are big cost drivers. So instead of making 30 different weapons data links or 30 different secure processors, if they can, if the government can go in and look at those and say that those are big cost drivers and we can, we can contract for this and we can make sure that they're used in all the weapons or in platforms because 
we demand that interface to be compliant with the, the weapon system and the munitions open system architecture. Uh, that lets us integrate it very quickly. We carve out that swap in the weapon design and that has to fit in there and the interface works. And now we can design something very fast and we can get it fielded very, very quickly. And when that part can be modernized, um, as long as it fits within that swap and it is what's the most compliant, it's a pretty easy change for industry to do. So I, I think that's probably the way we can go the fastest in the near term. Now, from a production standpoint, do these enhanced capabilities and design upgrades allow industry to look at new production practices? And here's where I'm going with this. The missile budgets are always run way too thin. If we ever got into serious conflict, we deplete our stocks in no time and the industry would have a really hard time uh, meeting demand. And the DOD has pressed everyone to build lines for efficiency, not wartime elasticity. So um, are there new production techniques and technologies uh, in these newer missiles that would allow us to better serve the enterprise if uh, the events demanded it? Uh, that's, that's a great question. It's one that I think across industry we struggle with every day. Uh, certainly, you know, all of, all of U.S. defense industry is they don't operate at a loss very long. And we have to answer to Wall Street, certainly, but, you know, our focus is always on that warfighting customer. And so we try and be as, a, as absolutely efficient as we can. Um, oftentimes, that drives supply chain to behaviors where it's just-in-time supply. Typically, the weapons are the bill payer in the military. And so you're challenged to get a multi-year contract, which now challenges us, defense industry, with our suppliers because you're, you're contracting for a year over year over year. And so they're not getting big orders, and so they can't order in bulk, which now raises the price. So we've talked about some things with, um, with the Air, Department of the Air Force over the past few weeks as, as we've gotten further further into support for the, for the conflict in Ukraine. And we're getting them to consider acquiring weapons differently. If we're able to break out the, the material and we have the service do a, a advanced buy of the material, that lets us put all these suppliers, which we, the U.S., has a lot of challenges with diminishing manufacturing sources. It lets us put them on contract where they can order the material, they can keep their workforce actively engaged and they can operate at a, at a peak efficiency for their factory. And we can still work with the Air Force for that lot buy. And they, can, they still have the point of leverage with, with defense industry for that, that we have to meet cost schedule performance. But it puts us well ahead of the game as far as being able to ramp up production very, very fast. Ideally, we do multi-years. That's the best way to drive savings. Um, internally, we fully embrace uh, digital technology. Uh, we do model-based system engineering. It helps us do our design work a lot more efficiently because we can run thousands of iterations of slight changes to the design and see how that affects the performance of the weapon so that we, we pick the optimum design of that. We do the same thing with software we call DevSecOps. And we're seeing significant efficiency improvements in the speed in which we're able to develop the software and as they're in each sprint, we're seeing better performance out of that because we're modeling this ahead of time. And so those two combined, they certainly help us deliver a lot quicker. Ultimately, it comes down to the, the service setting the requirement, uh, advocating effectively over on the Hill to preserve that funding so it doesn't become a bill payer, and then over to industry to deliver what we, what we sign up to on cost schedule and performance. The capacity issue, that's, that's a great question. You know, and that ultimately it comes down to the services. So, you know, you build up your, your global inventory based upon your, your major combat operations, based upon your war plans. And so you, you have to have adequate supplies so that uh, you don't run out. Um, it's very difficult because of the long lead items that we're seeing out of supply chain to, to rapidly ramp up production. Um, so there has to be adequate inventory in the stockpile. We've taken a lot of that at risk, and I think, I think you're seeing it play out with Ukraine. So they're looking for help. They're looking for munitions coming in, and those munitions are typically pulled out of uh, allies' stockpiles to fill out the Ukraine need, their, their warfighting demand, and then those countries have to replenish those stockpiles, and often that's a long lead time. Now, all the COVID shutdown certainly hasn't, help this problem. Uh, supply chain crisis hasn't helped the problem. 
Uh, we're seeing some electronic components that had a 60 day lead time go to 700 days now. And that's, that's one of those key points that we discussed with the air force on the need to break out that long lead material and have that as a separate contract. And let's do that in the first quarter of a fiscal year and then let our contracts battle on the lot by after that, but let's get the material all in order so that when the contract is let, then we can build and we can build that rate. So we're meeting cost cutter performance. So if we look at the world in a couple of years and we pursue the path that you're describing, what sort of operational advantages would you see us realizing? So I, I think if we go down this path and we accelerate the procurement and we fill out our munitions stockpiles, it certainly puts us in a better deterrent position. You know, our, our adversaries watch us and they have very good insight into our status. They have incredibly good insight into the way that we've executed war. They've watched us for the past 25 years. And so we've got to do things a little bit differently. I think with the PQ guide, the product improvements that we're doing to the existing weapons, not just us, but across the defense industry, we're delivering new capability to the warfighter. They'll develop new tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, and we're not in a war right now. So that now becomes a, uh, a question mark in any future adversary. We need weapons officers to be weapons officers. We need to look at those, those TTPs as that's the basic blocking and tackling. So that's, that's your point of departure. And we need pilots, our, our air crew, to get innovative and look at different ways of using the weapons that we have. That's when you see those big revolutions in the way the military operates. All right, got it. Um, evolving uh, capability for near-term improvements is important. However, I also think we probably want to look at uh, revolutionary game-changing options. Uh, and as far as I see it, this is the other half of the equation. The evolutionary path buys down risk in the near term, but looking at more revolutionary options gets us to where we need to be over the long run. So how do you see this? So that's, that's a great question as well. And that, that's that capabilities uh, trades challenge that the services have. Um, all of them play future games where they, they uh, model out the threat capabilities uh, now all the way through the future, so 2035 into 2040. And they play our existing programs of record through the FIDEP, and then they look at some of the new concepts, and they model those in, and they see where, where they get the most bang for the buck, you know, which, which one changes the outcome of, of that model war fight. And they try and, make, they try and make investment decisions based upon that. I think probably one of the best ways to do it for the government work with industry as an output from that is uh, certainly you've seen the secretary of the air force put out as operational imperatives. So that, that provides a good strategic framework of where the service is going that, you know, industry will try and read tea leaves from, but the, the more we can get clear priorities, very clear, concise requirements, and we talked about this a little bit before the uh, interview. It's focusing in on focusing in on those threshold requirements. You know, what does this weapon need to do uh, to be effective, to be bought? And and there has to be that tail on it for industry for it to become a program record. The objective requirements; those really should be what the service is looking for out of a program or record, such that the weapon has built into it the the headspace. So that in a block two, it can have that or a block three or a block four. Uh, so that it's not, you buy it once and then it's a throwaway. Um, it just costs too much to integrate. It takes too long to train on these and it takes too long to develop the tactics, techniques and procedures to do a, let's, let's do one weapon, throw it away. Let's do another weapon, throw it away, do another weapon. If we can learn from what the Chinese have done, you know, develop a very, very good, threshold capability and feel that in a weapon and then build upon that. You change out maybe the seeker, you change out maybe the warhead, and you change out the propulsion in it so you get a longer range. There'll be some key system attributes that you want to have in this block upgrade of the weapons. So I'd start with that. We have to be very clear in, in what the target set that we want to address with these new weapons are. And for that, it's going to have some attributes. Is it fixed? Is it moving? Is it hardened? Is it hardened deeply buried? Does it have electronic attack? What type of defenses around it? So what, what level of survivability does this have going in? All those drive the complexity of the weapon. And all, all those drive cost. I, I'll, I'll say it again. I really think that across DOD, when they're engaged with industry, they need to start with what's that cost point? We know the Air Force that we need. We know the Navy that we need. 
but what's the Air Force and Navy we can afford? And so as we're making all these capability trades, there's going to be a finite bucket of money that can go towards weapons. So let's let's design that to give the most capability to the warfighter that we can that's within that budget. Uh, that way we don't end up in this lengthy, lengthy design stroke that fields this weapon that's absolutely unaffordable. So how do you think about some of the longer term aspirational goals? What requirements are we trying to meet? That's an awesome question as well. So we've seen the gaps that the uh, Chinese have created with their fielding of new platforms, the A to AD capability, they're, they're expanding out uh, to the second island chain and with, with goals of being at the third island chain. We've seen how they've complicated a lot of our strategic calculus that we've had on how global peace should be enacted and, and how we should all behave. And, and with that, they've created these gaps. And so I think we're at an, an inflection point again with the services where Army's looking at really, really long range capabilities. They're working on a conventional prop strike, basically. It's, it's a ground launched uh, hypersonic capability that goes strategic ranges. Uh, Navy's doing the same thing that goes strategic ranges. The Air Force was looking at several hypersonic programs, uh, some that go strategic ranges, some that are at a theater level. The Navy was pursuing some air to air en enhancements and capabilities. The Air Force is, is pursuing those future air to air enhancement capabilities. I, I think all of us have paid attention. We're, we're significantly in debt as a nation and there's gonna be a, a fairly flat defense budget. So we need to make sure that we're getting the best capability that we can. And I know OSD is focused on this. I talked to a lot of, a lot of folks down in Cape and ATNL. We can't afford to buy four or five different unique weapons programs that really have a similar mission set. And I think that we're going to rapidly approach a point where the Navy and the Air Force, and I know that they hold warfighter talks, but they're going to have to agree upon what does that next long range air to air weapon look like? What does that next long range air to ground weapon look like? What does standard attack weapon look like? What are the real requirements? I mean, we're working off requirements that are almost eight years old right now, and that thing's not filled in for quite a few. So now before it goes on contracts, probably the time to update those requirements so that they're satisfying what the Navy sees as their gap in the 2030s and what the Air Force sees. But I, I truly do believe I, I, I don't like joint weapons. I don't like joint platforms because everybody has to compromise. But I, I truly think that we're at that point where we have to do that. Um, I also think that we have to, and, and I'm seeing this, we have to engage probably closer with some of our allies in development. Uh, they can help us with some of the diminishing manufacturing sources. Uh, so everything doesn't have to be made in America. We have trust partners and allies out there. And so bringing them into this production of, of some of these advanced weapons and making sure that we can integrate on them on their platforms are certainly a big, big consumer of F-35. Uh, they bought F-16s quite a bit, F F-18s, F-15Es, and now EXs internationally. And so they can help. They can help offset some of the development cost by bringing them in early instead of a, as an afterthought for military sales. Probably the most efficient way that we can reduce costs for the, for the Navy and the Air Force customers and probably the fastest way to get these to production because those larger numbers allow us to to do a larger buy with our supply chain, which allows us to reduce costs and then produce at a higher rate. And really that's that's where we need to be. So it applies, you know, that, that construct applies to existing weapons, but it absolutely applies to the new weapons that we're in development on. So what are some key technological areas that will require investment to help us realize this vision? Um, I, I would say probably in, in our processor capability and then also in propulsion. You know, we have significant uh, impact on diminishing manufacturing sources. You know, we've we've outsourced a lot of that overseas, and we've seen how fragile the supply chain can be with that. And we need to have domestic production of chips from trusted foundries that that industry can rely upon in through any crisis. Uh, same with propulsion. We're down to two propulsion houses, and that vertically aligned industry can be challenging. If there's a failure at one on a test stand that can have an impact across multiple programs. And so uh, diversifying that I think would be a very, very good investment for the services and for our nation. I've got to ask this, how do you see the allies and partners participating in this journey? 
So we, we work with them from industry as uh, suppliers and where we're licensed by the U.S. government to engage with them. Uh, we can bring them in as partners to accelerate that. This is where we need the services with their warfighter talks with these allies and then all the way up through the, the highest levels of government engaging so that we have these trusted allies that our government will license the partnering with and that, that fully enables industry to engage with that. They can be part of this design solution and part of the production solution, which will satisfy our speed of delivery and our capacity to delivery. All right, sir. Last question, given that we're getting tight on time here. Um, how will we know if we're successfully tracking on this vision? What are the indicators to follow? That's a million dollar question. So I'd say the, the best measure of our success on that, um, it's twofold. So we hit on the capacity. So we're hitting inventory objectives and those obviously they're all classified, but from the service perspective, they're looking at their inventory numbers and they're going up. We're seeing that weapons are stopped. They stop being the bill pair, which means that as industry, we're, we're delivering on cost schedule performance. And from our war fighters, we're getting the feedback that the capability enhancements that we're delivering for these product improvements, that they're able to develop tactics, techniques, and procedures that are putting them in the win column instead of parity. Uh, we want to have overmatching capability every time we face any adversary. We never want it to be a fair fight. We want it to be a, an absolute shutout. You know, the hundred to zero game that ever that all the parents cry about. That's exactly what we want. Anytime any adversary would challenge us with, with conflict. That's, that's winning in my mind. And then we, we get the feedback from, from the warfighters. I, I love uh, venues like this with, with Mitchell Institute. It's, um, it's awesome when we get to AFA. Uh, I'm so glad that they're in person again, because you get that one-on-one -on -one feedback with the folks that are actually out using your products. And, you know, if, if they trust that it's going to work every time uh, that they hit the weapon release button and they have absolute confidence, then for us in industry, that's winning. Um, for engaging with the, with the um, acquisition process, it's, it's when we, we have that collaboration and it's not transactional. We're actually engaged in, in discussions for trades on, um, on perhaps a capability improvement or, or a fielding expediency. And, and we're able to work with them, that, that's winning in my mind. Uh, and that's, that's really how we have to attract this, we have to attack this problem as industry and as government. We've got to be partnered. We, it, it cannot be adversarial. It's, it's definitely getting better, and I, I think there's still room for improvement. Well, John, I can't say thanks enough for shedding some light on our weapons capabilities. I'm hopeful that we'll squeeze every inch of this technology uh, into the missiles and get every mile of lethality out of them. So thank you so much. That's, that's absolutely our goal. And, um, you know, thank you again. Really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. And thanks to the Mitchell Institute. What a great organization. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.